Um, which we don't really need for the next couple of weeks because we're doing Hamlet, and I've just assigned that by act numbers. Uh, we probably, we won't, not probably, we won't finish Midsummer Night's Dream today. We'll finish it on Monday. So we're going to be about a day behind, but that's not a problem really. Um, I've got kind of extra time built in with the poetry towards the end of the semester that we can easily... Um, do more poems than I have assigned on a, a single day, so we shouldn't have to drop anything. But that is under the uh, content section on D2L. You probably want to uh, print it out, both uh, in Word version and PDF version. And remember, there will be a quiz on Monday over the entirety of A Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay? So we're picking up with Act 2, Scene 1, where... Oberon and Titania meet. Page 1557 in your book. About, I don't know, line 60-62. Oberon comes in, kind of on through, through one door of the stage, and Titania and her followers come in through another door. And they kind of come out and meet in the middle, almost like you know, armies marching against each other. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. What? Jealous Oberon? Fairy skip hints, I have forsworn his bed and company. His bed and company. So they're not sleeping together. In fact, she doesn't even want to be in the same space okay, as Oberon. Why is this important? Can you have a marriage if you're not sleeping together or don't want to be in the same room as the person you're married to? Not generally. Not, not a successful one. Okay? And here's another reason why. In the Renaissance, in Shakespeare's writing, they had this belief system, kind of the, their worldview of how everything hung together, the, how the world was, that has been called... Part of it's been called the great chain of being. And that's that everything that has a has a, a an existence, except for God, exists in a kind of a hierarchical chain of existence. So at the top of that would be the very highest of the angelic orders, cherubim and seraphim, all the way down to the very lowest level of existence. Now Existence doesn't mean physical nature, because angels aren't physical. They're intellectual beings, but they're, they're created. So the great chain of creation, so to speak, all the way down to modern particle physics, you know, nuons and gluons, whatever the bits and pieces are that make up the very smallest pieces of reality. Okay? So within that chain, you have differing hierarchies. Again, Angelic creatures are at the top. Traditionally, humans are right below that. But you have to make account for the existence of things like fairies. Okay? And in some classifications, fairies would be included in the angelic or supernatural beings. Meaning, angelic and demonic beings. Okay? But I'm going to break them out for this reason. So that fairies kind of are between humans and angels. After all, fairies have physical form. You can kill a fairy. Rub a, rub, uh, run a sword through a fairy and that fairy will die. Chop a fairy's head off, that fairy will die. Okay, Within the construct of Shakespeare's plays in the Middle Ages. But they can also do what? That we can't do. They can make themselves invisible for Puck says he can put a circuit around the globe in what? 40 minutes. Nobody can do that. We can't even do that in planes. We can barely do that in our, you know, spacecraft. Satellites take about 40, anywhere from 45 to about 90 minutes to go around the globe. Okay? So, I mean, there's some differences there. 
Many of humanity, and even within humanity, you have hierarchical structures, right? I know, 2018, we don't like to think there's any kind of hierarchy in society. Guess what? There is. How do you know? Because we have a president. And none of us is the president. Okay? We have a vice president. We have, okay, now this is the governmental structure, but what about not in the governmental structure? We have, hate to say it, even though in America we try to pretend we don't, we have a social class structure. We have an upper class, a middle class, a lower class. We can go into other countries where it is a much, much more rigid class structure, where those maybe in the lower class can never rise up to one of those higher classes. We, you can. You can be upper class and fall to lower class. You can be lower class and rise to upper class, okay? Then beneath humans, you have the beasts. So often within Renaissance literature, you have poets and writers talking about, you know, appealing to our better natures, meaning appealing to the angelic aspect of humanity. Because notice, humanity is between angels and beasts. Appealing to our angelic side. That is, going out of our way to be nice to people, to help people. As opposed to appealing to our darker side, or bestial side. Pretty interestingly, what is going to happen in just a few moments to Bottom the Weaver? He gets an ass's head put on his head. So once he has that ass's head on, where is he here? He's like the borderline. Okay. Physical representation of how one can devolve. How? By giving into one's baser instincts or characteristics. So she says, I forsworn his bed and company. Why did I go off into all this? Because just as if I were to bring in a chain or take this chain off from around my neck, if I were to hold this chain up and get a pair of wire snips and snip a link, what happens to everything below that? It falls. It no longer hangs from, it is no longer dependent upon what's up above. So if you have a problem in this link, What happens to everything below it? There's problems there. So we are told here, the beginning of Act 2, what about the relationship between Oberon and Titania? They've not been getting along. How long? Just since the beginning of this act? No. It's implied since before the beginning of the play. Well, what happened at the beginning of the play? Between... Okay, Think of this structure now. We talked about political structure, government structure, social class structure. What is another hierarchy within humanity? The family. The family is the basis of society. Okay? Shakespeare's writing within the Judeo-Christian tradition, which says, and is believed when he's writing it, according to St. Paul, What's at the top of the family? Okay, you can say parents. What's at the top of the parents? Husbands. Then wives. Fathers. Then mothers. Then children. Okay. Well, what did we see within 15 lines of the opening of the play? Jesus comes in, dragging his daughter almost. What do we see right there? That family relationship, it's all out of whack. This isn't a nicely hanging chain. Something is wrong. Why? Because something's wrong with you. See, this has ramifications all throughout. They also had an idea. Put away my markers. Of this thing called, that kind of corresponds to this. Doctrine of correspondences. 
That is, everything that happens in these realms has a correspondence in the physical, natural environment. So, if there's something wrong here, and something wrong here, or something wrong here, guess where else there will be problems in? The natural world. Well, the natural world doesn't just mean rocks and trees and flowers. It also means animals, but it also means weather. It also means the skies. So in just a few moments, we are going to hear Titania, beginning lines 82 or so and following, talking about problems going on where? The weather? Kind of astronomical issues? The animal world? Animals are bringing forth stillbirth animals. The wheat is dying. It is a forward winter. Okay, she's talking about the weather's not right. It ought to be spring. What time of year is it? Midsummer, right? But she's implying it's cold. And we do know during Shakespeare's lifetime, I can't remember what year it was, the Thames froze in summer. It was part of what's called the Little Ice Age that went from late 15th century to the very early 18th century. Where we know there was freezing weather in summer in the middle, in uh, Europe. Okay? Some have said that that kind of thing is actually more to be worried about than so-called you know, climate change or, or warming and such. It all has to do with the sun, by the way. Okay? So she goes into this big, long thing about all these problems in the natural world. Okay? And what does Oberon say? Line 118. Do you amend it then? What do you mean? You can fix all that. You can fix it so that there aren't eclipses, so that there aren't meteor showers, so that there aren't storms, so that there aren't abnormal fogs, so that animals don't deliver stillborn you know, offspring and such. How? It lies in you. Why should Titania cross her over on? Why must you be at loggerheads with me? All I want is a little changeling boy. What's a changeling? Did I talk about this the other day? The changeling is... I don't remember any of your names, so I'm going to just... He and his wife have a baby. And... Or child. And that baby or child, you know, just doesn't do what you tell them to do. Well, it's thought by anthropologists that we came up with the notion of a changeling to say, well, it's not actually our child. That's a changeling. That is, somebody came and took our child in the crib and replaced it with their child. Because my wife and I would never give birth to a little Adolf Hitler. I mean, nobody from my family would ever become an axe murderer kind of a thing. So we developed this idea of, well, there are these other beings, fairies who do that. And in the Middle Ages, changelings always came from fairies. Fairies took one of their own children and replaced your child with theirs and took yours. Right? Oberon says, Give me the little changeling boy. You know who's the little changeling boy? He's a boy that had been born, to Tanya will tell us, by a votress of her order. That is, someone who kind of worshipped her. The mother died in childbirth. The child is the son of an Indian king. And Oberon, all he simply wants this boy for is, I want him to be one of my henchmen. And there's all kinds of medieval stories about humans being captured and taken over to the fairy world, fairyland, 
to serve the fairies. Most of it, oddly enough, is their sexual slaves. Like the fairies can't get enough of fairies, so they steal humans. Men and women, by the way, it's kind of equal opportunity, sexual slavery. Right? But that's not what Shakespeare's about. And the fairies in, in the Middle Ages are not Shakespeare's, you know, little diminutive things that can, you know, sit in this cap. No, they're like Tolkien's elves. They're almost Nordic, you know, Chris Hemsworth kind of a thing. So, Titania says, nope. Does she just say nope? Your entire theory team could not buy this child. Wow. You could offer me the world, Oberon, I wouldn't take it. Why? Because she loves the boy so much? No, because she honors the sacrifice of the mother so much. So, Oberon, how long are you going to stick around in this wood? She goes, well, until after Theseus gets married. And what else have they said? She accuses Oberon of having a fancy for Hippolyta, queen of the Amazons. He accuses her of being partial to Theseus, helping him in through some sticky situations. So they're both kind of jealous. Right? Oberon, give me that boy and I'll come with you. She goes, not for my fairy kingdom. So she and her fairies leave, and Oberon says, fine. You're not going to leave from this grove till I told He's pissed. He's really mad. So, what does he do? Puck, get over here. And what does he tell Puck to do? Remember that little flower we saw? Cupid's arrow fly and it land? Go get it. Puck says, I'll put a girdle around about the earth in 40 minutes. That is, I'll find that flower. So Puck leaves and Oberon tells the audience, here's what I'm going to do with that. I'm going to wait until Titania falls asleep, and I'm going to squeeze it in her eyes so that when she wakes up, the very next thing she sees, she will fall madly in love with. What did I omit? What will be the very next thing she sees? Be it, line 180, lion, bear, wolf, or bull, on meddling donkey, or a busy ape. Notice, even if it's some guy, some Athenian, nope, non-human, notice, skipping a little, going down to the bestial world, world. at least humans have rationality, okay, no, he wants her to fall in love with, essentially, as Puck will call him, a monster. And Bottom really is a monster when Titania falls in love with him. Why? What's happened to him? The donkey head, right? Human body, head of a donkey. You can't get more monstrous than that. Oh, I guess you could. Human body and lion's head, maybe. Or, you know. In other words, it's not this and it's not this. That's what makes it monstrous. Okay? So, he says, and I won't take this charm from off her sight until she gives me that child. We, we're not told how long that's going to be. Oberon hears a commotion, and he says, I am invisible. And I will overhear their conference. Demetrius and Helena come in. How is Demetrius behaving towards Helena? No. He hates her. That's pretty much it. How is she behaving towards him? She loves him. She's fawning over him. I mean, she is crazy in love. He's like, I hate you. I don't want to see you. You make me sick. And she goes in yet still. I know. Why? She's being irrational in love. He's being irrational in hate. Okay? So, 
Again, Oberon watches all this. They leave. And Oberon says, line 245, Fear thee well, nymph. By calling her a nymph, what is he making out of Helena? Where do nymphs exist on this chain? Nope, they're not beasts. They're above human. Nymphs are goddesses. Like goddesses of trees. Naiads and dryads. Naiads, I think, were trees. Dryads were water spirits. Okay? They're above humanity. They might not be much above humanity, but they're above humanity. Fare thee well, nymph. He says, ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall see. In other words, he's going to get what's coming to him. Why? Why does Oberon care? It's kind of like he is suggesting love ought to be reciprocated. If she's made it, then he ought to love her. Does he know at this point that before the play began, Demetrius wooed Helena and in fact was a Engaged to her? Because we're going to be told that later. No, he doesn't have that. Doesn't know that at all. So, Puck comes in, and Oberon tells him about where Titania is. He says, I'm going to go to Titania. I'm going to put this in her eyes. There's a sweet Athenian lady fleeing, or, or with a Athenian youth, arrange it so that when he wakes up, put the juice in his eyes while he's asleep, so that when he wakes up, he will love her. You'll know him by his Athenian garb. Now, how many people has Oberon seen in the wood, other than the fairy realm? Two, Demetrius and Helena. So he doesn't have to say he's about yay tall, Brown hair, beard. He's got Athenian clothes on. Okay. So we get scene two. Titania comes in with her fairies. They sing her to sleep. Oberon steps forth, squeezes the juice in her eye, and says, "When thou, what thou seest, about line 32, what thou seest when thou dost wake, do it for thy true love take. Love and language for his sake, be it ounce or cat or bear, part or boar or pretzel hair, in thy eye that shall appear when thou wakest, it is thy dear. Notice, what you see is what you will love. Okay? Seeing and loving, and the relationship of sight and love, is a, is a theme that Shakespeare is dealing with this. Should, should one merely fall in love, what's the phrase? At first sight. Or does it take more? How many of you have ever, quote unquote, I'll be, oh, fall in love at first sight? I have. First time I saw the woman I later married, I knew. I hadn't even heard her voice, I hadn't even talked to her. Okay? Of course, that also happened two or three times before that. <laughs> Nothing came of those. So, Lysander and Hermia come in. Where's Titania? She's still asleep. Sacked out. Oberon is left. Lysander and Hermia come in. So we've had these two unlovers, and now we get these two lovers come in. Then they're tired, and Hermia says, find you a bed, and I'm going to lay down here by this bank. And Lysander said, well, you know, we can both lie down there. I mean, that's, that's, that's big enough for both of us. Hermia, nay, good Lysander, further off, do not lie so near. Go, oh, no, no, I didn't, mean it. I didn't mean to lie with you. I mean, we're not going to have sex or anything. We're doing and he says a bunch of stuff, and she said, Lysander Riddle's very pretty. In other words, <laughs> you know, move. Why? 
Because she says such separation, you sleeping over there, me sleeping over here, becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. It is fitting for a bachelor and a maid who are virtuous. So far be distant and good night, sweet friend. Thy love near altar till thy sweet life end. Your love, what? For me. Don't let it end. When? Until you die. They're not married, right? Neither of them has said Protestant wedding ceremony. Till death do us die. Well, she just did. Lysander. Amen, amen to that fair prayer. And then in life, when I in loyalty, may my life end when I'm no longer loyal or faithful to you. Well, what's going to happen? Pup comes in. Any lady? If any of you? He puts that juice in his eyes. And Puck leaves. In in come Helena and Demetrius. And they come in over here, not over here. Because over here is where Army is sleeping. They come in. And Helena sees Lysander. What does she assume? He's dead. She rushes up to him. She kind of moves him a little, doesn't see any stab wounds, and shakes him. Wake up, Lysander, wake up. What does he do? And run through fire I will for thy sweet sake. Line 109. Transparent Helena, nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. Do not say so, Lysander. Why? Because what has he just said without saying it? He's using poetic language. You are dropped dead gorgeous and you have stolen my heart. No! Why not? You're supposed to be in love with Hermia. Content with Hermia? No, I do repent the tedious minutes I with her have spent. What's tedious mean? If something, if a job is tedious, what does that mean? Boring and it takes a long time. It's boring time. It's that slowly tick tock. Oh, God, please make the time go by quickly. Oh, a tedious minutes. Not Hermia, but Helena I love. Who will not change a raven for a dove? Well, what's the difference between a raven and a dove? Well, one, ravens are bigger than doves. But that's not what he's getting at at all, because it's just the opposite. Helena is taller than Hermia. A raven is black, a dove is white. That's what he's getting at. See, Hermia ought to be, at the very least, very least, tan or tanned. And Helena should be fairly palely complete. Or Hermia should be black, and Helena should be white. And you'll see this kind of emphasized three other times. So, who will not change a raven for a dove? The will of man is by his reason swayed. And reason says you are the worthier man. Really? How so? How does reason say, hmm? Well, part of it is that coloration in the Elizabethan mindset. Why? Because in the Elizabethan mindset, this is the ideal of beauty. Not all the white folks in this room are somewhat not white. They're pinkish or a little tannish. Notice the difference. This is white white. This is like powdered sugar white. Where does that ideal come from? It's not because they're all racist. It's because Queen Elizabeth thought that was the ideal of white, and she powdered her face white like this. Okay. 
pretty scary when you think about it. So that anything that detracted from that, any, you know, just like that, <laughs> that's the opposite. In other words, just slightly tan means not beautiful. Okay? And reason says you're the word you're at. Helena, wherefore was I into this mockery board? Why are you mockery, mocking me? What have I done, she is suggesting, to deserve this? Is it not enough that I didn't know? She's saying, is it not enough that I'm in love with Demetrius and I can't even get a smile from him? That now you have to pretend? Is that what she thinks is going on? And so she leaves. And notice, at that point, Lysander notices Hermia. Because it's almost like he forgot about her. She sees not Hermia. Hermia, sleep thou there, and never mayst thou come Lysander near. <laughs> Go, don't ever enter my presence. And Hermia wakes up thinking what? That he's dead. Does she? Does she think Lysander's dead? Does she think that? She thinks she had a dream. She said, what a dream was here. Lysander, look how I do quickly. She's shaking. Methought a serpent ate my heart away. What's her heart? She's not talking literally. Some snake comes in, rips through her chest, and eats her. Her heart is what? Lysander. And some serpent took it away. Who's the serpent? Hermia, though she doesn't know that yet. Okay? So she goes off looking for Lysander. Meanwhile, to Tanya, you know, Act 3, what do we see? Notice, by the way, setting Athens, all of Act 1, the wood, Act 2 through Act 4, Scene 1, Athens, Act 4, Scene 2, through the end of the play. So the mechanicals come in. We talked about this the other day. Why do they go to the wood? They don't want anybody in Athens seeing them practicing, rehearsing their play. And what happens? They go through their lines. Bottom says his. He goes off stage like he's supposed to. When he comes back on, what has happened? Puck has put an ass's head on him. That's not. Puck puts a mask on him. Puck turns his head into the head of a donkey. Ears, nose, eyes, you know, like donkey in Shrek, you know, the whole nine yards. Eddie Murphy's mouth, voice, and everything. What do the other mechanicals do? Okay, remember, these are not people who have spent a day thinking. These are men who work with their hands. They run. They're scared. So Bottom's like, I see their daydream. They are, they're trying to frighten me. They're trying to make an ass of me. Bottom hasn't looked in a mirror. He doesn't know what's happened to him. So he says, I'm going to walk up and down and I'm going to sing a song. Well, I can sing a song. And I've seen this done both ways. Where Bottom can have a drop-dead gorgeous voice. I mean, he could be a pick your singer. Or, he just sounds horrible. And I used to like to do this when I taught in classroom with chocolate. You know, just... <laughs> oh, so God, so black of you, with orange talk. That's what I think he ought to sound like. And here's why. What angel wakes me from my flower bed? See, angels' voices are perfect. Every time when they sing. They're never out of tune. Bottom, not quite. He keeps singing horribly, if I were directing it. 
And Titania says, I pray thee, gentle mortal, sing again. Mine ear is much enamored of thy note. So is mine eye enthralled to thy shape. Her eye is enthralled to his shape. Again, notice, seeing is loving. But what does enthralled mean? What does it mean to be enthralled to someone? Close, but a lot. Take infatuation and put it on steroids. It's enslaved. Her eye is enslaved by his shape. That is, his shape has taken control. What is his shape? Now, personally, I think they cast, if you see National Shakespeare Festival's version of Midsummer Night's Dream, if I were directing it, I would have changed two of the cast members. I think the guy who's playing Bottom should have played um, Demetrius. And the guy who's playing Demetrius should have played Bottom. Why? Bottom shouldn't be kind of hunky. Bottom sh would be better, you know, a little punchy, a little out of shape. He shouldn't be physically attractive. And I'm not saying the guy who plays Demetrius isn't physically attractive, but, you know, he could stand to lose a few pounds. Yeah, I'm body shaming, okay? He could stand to lose a few pounds. The guy who plays bottom, he loses any weight, he's going to be skinny. I mean, he's ripped, okay? So, in thy fair virtues forth perforce doth move me on the first view, love at first sight, to swear I love thee. Notice bottom's response. Okay. Why does she say this? Never remember what time Let me see. Why does she say this? Is it because love is rational? No. Why is she enthralled? Love juice in her eyes, right? This is a love potion. She has no choice in the matter. So she's not seeing correctly. But methinks, mistress, you should have little reason for that. Notice, she's talking about love. He talks about reason. When he says, methinks you should have little reason for that, he's kind of saying, that two and two doesn't add up to four. <laughs> Why? And yet to say the truth, Reason and love keep little company together nowadays. The more the pity that some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Reason, uh, reason and love keep little company together nowadays. He's saying now, in our time, reason and love, what? They don't live side by side. They don't work together. They what? They're separate. What's taken to be love is not rational. What's taken to be rational cannot be love. The more the pity. Why? That some honest neighbors will not make them friends. Is he saying some honest neighbors like not cast the first? Here's reason, here's love, here's a neighbor, here's a neighbor. You two neighbors, you want to get these two to get along better. Not what he means. He means reason and love are neighbors. And neighbors, what? Should be friends if they're honest. Neighbors should get along, in other words. Neighbors should not build. 20 foot walls to, or fences to separate themselves from their neighbors. Neighbors should not you know, call the police on their neighbors for doing things that neighbors should be allowed to do in their own homes or in their yards, etc. I read a story news account the other day. Some woman sitting out on her front property and her property let her daughter, her eight year old daughter, walk her little dog. Down the street, she could see her daughter, she said, for almost the entire walk. 
One of her neighbors called the cops. The cop came, talked to her, then talked to the neighbor and said, what are you doing? There's no problem here. The neighbor, apparently not satisfied with the cops, this is in Illinois, called the Department of Children's Services, which, if you've ever heard about these kind of of the cop, means it's not they just come and go, well, that's not a problem. No. That lady's life now gets turned upside down for several weeks. And, but it finally comes down to, keep your freaking nose out of her business, you know? Children can walk down the street. It's not neglect. So, the more that some honest neighbors will make them friends, reason and love, he's saying, should work together. Thou art as wise as thou art. She says. And yet, most critics, most readers who read Bottom's line take Bottom to be spouting utter nonsense. Reason and love shouldn't be put together. Well, how do we know that's nonsense? Because of what to come this is. Thou art as wise as thou art beautiful. Well, how beautiful is he? He's a freaking ass. <laughs> Take that back. He's not even an ass. A, a plain old donkey. He's part donkey, part human. That's even worse. So, if he's not beautiful, then according to the simile, how wise can he be? Well, he can't be wise either. Yeah, but who says that line? A woman whose reason pew, is out the door. Why? She's under a love potion. She's under a spell. So can we take her words to really mean anything? So can we then take them to mean the opposite? Because the way many critics say it is, well, he's not wise. Bottom, not so neither. But if I had wit enough to get out of this world, if I had wit, if I had intellect, intelligence, wisdom, I would leave this wood. And she goes, whoa, no, 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 no. You are not leaving here. Uh, uh, uh. You are mine. So while she says, your shape enthralls me, <laughs> she's going to enthrall his shape. His body is hers. All right? So she orders her fairies to do his bidding. And they do. They all leave. And Oberon comes in <coughs> and asks, I wonder if Titania be awake. Now, when my wife and I were in London in 2002, saw a bunch of plays at the Globe, and for this play, we got Groundling tickets. Groundling tickets are the, the groundlings are the people who stand in the yard. Okay? And we got there early enough so that when they opened the doors, we rushed in so that if this were the stage, or this whole thing were the stage, we are smack dab right in the middle. And the stage goes up to like this on my wife. So she you know, is right here. And we're standing there. And the guy who plays over on Odysseus. One is Scottish, with a thick Scottish accent, and just drop-dead gorgeous. I mean, hunk-tastic, okay? Kind of got even, even men would go, damn, it's just not fair. And we're standing there, and my wife, I mean, Scott, she just turns the fire. And we're standing there, and he comes out, and he doesn't come out like I've seen other actors do, you know, to the audience. I wonder if Tatanya be awake. He comes down, and he's down on his knee, and looks her right in the eye, like this far away from her face. And she's just going, oh, no, no, no. and he asks them, yes. She responds. And I'm like, can you tell her? Because 3,000 pairs of eyes. Are there. <laughs> no. no. Yes. Then what it was, but he. Reverse those. Then what 
was it that next came in on? Well, it was an ass. No! And he starts laughing. He goes, yes. And I mean, the whole freaking globe is just going crazy. And then at the end of the play, when he came out, when they came out to take their vows, he kind of does this to her. She still gets the warm fuzzy thinking about it. So Puck comes in. Puck tells him, Oberon, this falls out better than I could devise, line 35. Notice, he doesn't stop there. Why not? He's still thinking about Demetrius and Helena. He's still concerned about that love being restored. Did you... Fix the uh, Athenian? He says, yeah, found him. And he goes, when Demetrius and Hermia come in, Oberon, well, this is the Athenian, but, well, this is the woman. And that's not the man. That is, that's not the man whose eyes I anointed. And what do we hear? We hear Demetrius and Hermia. Now, Demetrius hasn't had anything yet. Beginning to play, he loved Hermia. Guess what? He still loves Hermia. Okay. Hermia is as she was at the beginning of play. She doesn't care anything about Demetrius. She still loves Lysander. But now, Lysander loves Helena. So nobody loves Hermia, and everybody loves Helena. Helena still loves Demetrius. Okay. So, Hermia sleeps, uh, excuse me, goes off. Demetrius lies down and falls asleep, and Oberon turns to He is furious. <clears throat> Thou hast mistaken quiet and laid the love juice, notice, on some true love's sight. See, your sight ought to be true. True there doesn't necessarily mean the opposite of false. It means straight, perfect. Like a bicycle tire is true if all of the spokes are properly tight. Go up to somebody's bike sometime with a little wrench and loosen all the spokes. And you know what happens to that tire? It goes like this. Okay? Therefore, some true love has been turned and not a false turn true. But, well, who cares? Then fate overruled. Why? It was fate that made me do that, he says. One man holding troth, a million fail, confounding oath on. What's he just said? One in a million men is true, is honest, is loyal, is faithful, in love. Wow! There's a negative perspective. Keep in mind, he's not human. He's a fairy. Okay? Oberon, go. In other words, you're going to fix this. Find Helena of Athens all sick with fancy, bring her here so that she lies down next to Demetrius and falls asleep. He says, I'm going to fix his eyes. Okay? So he puts it in her, in Demetrius' eyes. Puck comes back and he says, here's Helena. And the youth, mistook by me, he's here too. Notice, he doesn't know his name. Pleading for a lover's feet. Shall we their fawn pageant see their foolish acting? Actions. Lord, what fools these mortals be. Why? Why are we, these mortals, fools? Because when we fall in love, we do what? Some stupid. <laughs> we do crazy things. Okay? That's what he means. Oh, so. The fairies don't. All right. So, Lysander and Helena come in, and what happens? Demetrius wakes up, and he sees Helena and falls in love. Oh, Helen, goddess nymph, perfect divine, to what, my love, shall I compare thine eye? Your eye. And what does she immediately assume? We're all in this together. You planned this. 
This is why Hermia told me what you were doing. You just want to play. She's ready to, you know. And what do we see? Lysander then says a bunch of stuff, and he finishes talking about Helena, whom I do love and will do till my death. There's the till death do I part to him. Okay. So we get this great scene, I'm going to skip a bunch, where the lovers start to fight. I mean, Lysander and Demetrius, they're really ready to kill each other. Not for Hermia, for Helena. Hermia's ready to kill Helena because she stole her love. We'll pick up, we're a little behind, we'll pick up at the end of that scene on Monday. Um, probably somewhere on page 1579. Remember, quiz over the whole play.